over the last couple years, Netflix has really upped their game with TV shows, movies, cartoons being brought to our eyes. Some of these are based off of books, some are based off of comics, and some are just Netflix originals. But what we're going to talk about today is one that is based off of the book series written by Julia Quinn, and that is the Bridgerton series. But more specifically, we're going to be talking about the prequel of the Bridgerton series, Queen Charlotte, A Bridgerton Story. Now, Bridgerton, like I said, is written by Julia Quinn. They're historical fiction, they're romance, they keep you intrigued from the first page to the very last. So, while Julia Quinn has brought a wonderful imagination to paper for us to read, she has had help of bringing it to our eyes that we can watch on TV with the help from none other than Shonda Rhimes. If you're not familiar with who Shonda Rhimes is, she is the producer of shows such as Grey's Anatomy, Private Practice, Station 19. These two women have come together and created for us a lovely prequel about none other than Queen Charlotte and King George III. Queen Charlotte is well known for picking the diamond of the season in Bridgerton. During their social season, that's where the young ladies come out and they try to find a suitor and a husband. That's what members of the ton in Bridgerton do. We see there's some emotion going on with Queen Charlotte and King George. And that is where this prequel comes into play. We've all seen the hype and the popularity of Queen Charlotte of Bridgerton story on Netflix. The Bridgerton prequel series debuted on May 4th and it saw a whopping 1.9 billion watch minutes in just the first few days. Queen Charlotte of Bridgerton story shares with us the love story, the obstacles, the adversity, of a specific couple that we have learned about in our history classes. And that is none other than Queen Charlotte, obviously, and King George III. King George III was the king during the American Revolution and is quite known as the king who lost America or is also known as the Mad King. So what I'm here to discuss with you all is the historical accuracy of Queen Charlotte of Bridgerton story. So let's get into it. Charlotte was born in Germany in 1744 in a well-known principality known as Mecklenburg Strelitz. So not only was she German, she was a German princess. To stand out to potential husbands back then, a young lady during that time needed to be well-rounded. Charlotte was well-rounded enough. She was well enough educated and she spoke French and she excelled in music. She was sweet and good humored and she was also lively but tempered and that caught the eye of a certain British royal at this time. In 1761, when Charlotte was only 17 years old, she found herself chosen to be the bride of none other than King George III. It's also known that Charlotte had a most agreeable countenance and that just means she had a pretty face, but she wasn't ravishingly beautiful to the point that it was distracting. George III sent one of his lords, Lord Harcourt, to collect his new bride from Germany. Lord Harcourt says that Charlotte has very pretty eyes, but that she is no regular beauty. However, she did have her charms about her, including the fact that she had white and even teeth. Now, the journey from Germany to England was not easy. It was actually so rough on Charlotte that she had lost so much weight that her wedding gown that she had made was falling off of her. On September 8th, 1761, George and Charlotte were married at St. James Palace by the Archbishop of Canterbury. And then a few weeks later, on September 22nd, the official coronation of King George III and Queen Charlotte took place at Westminster Abbey. As depicted in Queen Charlotte of Bridgerton's story, the first part of their marriage had a lot of trouble, had a lot of drama, a lot of fighting, a lot of questions that needed to be answered. We see in the show that Charlotte wanted a real marriage full of love and happiness, and she wanted that in real life too. She wanted to sleep in the same bed in the same house as her new husband, like any newlywed couple would want. She wanted true love and she wasn't gonna settle for anything less. Regardless of how the marriage came to be, Charlotte realized both fictionally and really that she wanted a real marriage. In the show, we see that on the night of their wedding, George goes to drop her off at the Queen's house, which is what we know now as Buckingham Palace. And he was going to reside at 
the palace in queue. It was their wedding night, and she did not want to be apart from her new husband. During this argument with Charlotte, George threw it in her face that he was the king and everyone had to answer to him. And this made Charlotte feel inferior and feel like they were not equal in this marriage. And this goes on to create some heavy tension in their marriage later on. Being part of the royal family comes with a lot of responsibilities. One of the most prominent responsibilities that you have as a royal is to create what is called an heir and a spare. The bloodline of the crown needed to remain stable. Therefore, producing an heir was almost the immediate priority. We see this in the show in two different ways. Obviously, one being that Charlotte and George need to have a baby. They need to create an heir to their line. But also with the older Charlotte, trying to get one of her 15 children to produce a legitimate heir to the throne. While it took some practice to get their first heir, Charlotte and George had their first son, who later became known as George IV, and then eventually had 14 more children. They took the saying, an heir and a spare, quite seriously. Producing their heir was really not a problem at all, but we see a problem with an heir in the first episode of Queen Charlotte Bridgerton's story. During the night, a doctor visits the palace and it's the middle of the night. And so Charlotte assumes the worst and assumes it's George. And she comes out and she says, is he dead? Thankfully, it was not George who had died, but it was their granddaughter, the heir to the throne who had died in childbirth with the next heir. So we see two generations of an heir wiped out immediately. This caused Charlotte to panic and seem a bit harsh towards her children as she pushed them to have babies. She was especially harsh towards her son who had just lost his daughter. We see that when he is upset and she says, sorrow, sorrow, prayers, prayers. The show's portrayal of the children is accurate as none of them had produced a legitimate heir aside from the princess royal granddaughter who just died in childbirth with the next royal heir. But having no heir to the throne was partly Charlotte and George's fault. Their six daughters were kept at home and had little chance finding their own husbands. Only three of them ever actually got married, and most of them were above the childbearing age by the time they did get married. And George was reluctant to marry off his daughters to foreign princes because he didn't want his daughters to live abroad. He wanted his daughters close to him. And after the king became ill, Charlotte believed it was the duty of their daughters to stay home and try to take care of him. The sons had the opposite problem, however. They had too much freedom. Charlotte was actually a Appalled by her sons because they seem to, instead of get married, just have girlfriends and just have wild, scandalous love affairs. And as a matter of fact, George and Charlotte's son, the Prince Regent, who later became known as George IV, was especially a feckless character, running up debts equivalent to what the nation was spending on the Royal Navy during the Napoleonic Wars. And so due to all these problems with the children not producing heirs, Charlotte was forced to marry off two of her sons, Prince Edward and Prince Frederick. Prince Edward ended up being married off to a woman named Victoria of Saxe Coburg Sawfield. And they had one daughter together, yes, an heir, who they named Victoria, who later became known as Queen Victoria. We know from our history classes that this royal bloodline has remained stable for generations. As a matter of fact, even to this day, the current King of England, Charles III, is actually the fifth great-grandson of George and Charlotte. With the issue of producing an heir out of our hair, let's move on to one of the next most discussed topics when watching Queen Charlotte Bridgerton's story, and that is George's mental illness. If you've watched seasons one and two of Bridgerton, you see that the queen is usually by herself. There are a few scenes though with King George. We see that George tends to be hidden from the public. But in season two, following the attempted wedding of Anthony Bridgerton and Miss Edwina, there's a scene where George comes out of his room while Charlotte is trying to mediate between Miss Edwina and Miss Kate and their mother and the problems that they're having with Anthony Bridgerton. As George comes out of his room, he is dead set on finding Charlotte because he is confused, he is frazzled, and he just wants to find Charlotte. He's confused and he believes it's his wedding day and he's wanting to speak to his queen. He even believes that he's missed his own wedding. But it's then that we see Miss Edwina speak up and try to calm the nerves of King George. And we see the sparkle of love in Charlotte's eyes. 
as she sees her king. And so after catching up on Bridgerton, a lot of us are left wondering what the heck is wrong with the king? And we start to get those answers in Queen Charlotte of Bridgerton's story. The first few episodes show the new king and queen trying to maneuver through their new married life. These first few episodes are where we see their relationship start to go through the basic relationship obstacles. But in later episodes, we see a new problem arise. In episode two, that's when we start to see signs of George's illness. He collapses after having a heated conversation with his mother. And the king orders Reynolds, who's like his personal assistant, to get the doctor and to make sure that Charlotte finds nothing out. Then in episode three, Charlotte wakes up in the middle of the night to see George drawing on the walls. And as she's trying to, to check on him and to say, George, what's wrong? He runs. He runs out of the palace and he starts talking to Venus, the planet. Charlotte witnesses this and rushes George inside the palace with the help of Reynolds. Then in episode four, we see a doctor diagnose George and declare that he remains consistent with an inflamed cerebellum. Dr. John Monroe steps in to rectify that he is not merely physical, but nervous. His condition is the result of disorganization of nerves. Dr. Monroe was a real person who dedicated his life trying to help those who struggle with mental illnesses. We also see the doctor try to cure George from his mental illness by using a wide variety of dangerous techniques. In the end, George and Charlotte accept their fate and accept the fact that chances of George fully recovering are slim to none. Charlotte realizes that her husband is not perfect and she never expected him to be. George is trying to hide himself from Charlotte. But she doesn't want that. She goes and finds him and she says, I will stand with you between the heavens and the earth. I will tell you where you are. So Charlotte and George decide to face his problems together as a team. And Charlotte continued to love George even through his madness. After watching Queen Charlotte Bridgerton's story, a lot of people still ask, well, what was the cause of George's mental issues? Some doctors concluded that George had a physical genetic liver-based disease called pyphoria. The notion that the king had acute porphyria was put forth most famously by a group of doctors in the 1960s. Dr. Ada McElpain and her son, Dr. Richard Hunter, are a mother-son team of psychiatrists who were the ones who declared George to have this acute porphyria. They made this claim after studying hundreds of volumes of George's medical records, which are based on very different types of illnesses and diseases than what we know today. We have to remember this was the 1700s. Anxiety, hallucinations, severe pain, nausea and vomiting, palpitations, high blood pressure, numbness, muscle weakness, red or brown urine and blindness are many of the symptoms of porphyria. Today, just a couple of his symptoms. George did have abdominal pain and he did suffer from seizures. And sometimes his seizures were so bad that his assistants would have to physically sit on him to restrain him. But much more recently, a team of doctors from St. George's at the University of London have countered that George did not actually suffer from porphyria, that he just had severe bouts of mental illness. Some researchers went to the archives and found some of the king's handwritten letters, and they focused on his use of language. And what's interesting about this retroactive study is that George's sentences were much longer during his episodes of illness compared to when he was well. When stricken with symptoms, he would compose 400 word sentences. Psychiatrists see the same form of nonstop speech and writing during the manic phase of bipolar disorder. Once the euphoria and the hyperactivity of the illness resolves, the person often falls into an abyss of depression. Then in 2005, a hair analysis finds high levels of arsenic. High amounts of arsenic can lead to neurological problems and poor mental health. The toxin was common medicine at this time, and it was likely that this medicine was was prescribed to the king to help control his attacks, but arguably it made it worse. When British porphyria expert Dr. Timothy Peters reviewed McElpine and Hunter's archival work, he found that they were quite selective in their reporting and interpretation of George's signs. His conclusion was that the diagnosis of the acute porphyria could no longer be supported and it needed to be revised. He had a great appetite of knowledge and books, and he was even one of the first to study science. Even though we see in some pop culture that he is portrayed to not be smart at all. So what caused King George's erratic behavior? I honestly can't say, but the porphyria bipolar disorder arguments, but without the physical evidence, 
it's really hard to back up claims to diagnose somebody from 200 years ago. Another question a lot of viewers have after watching Bridgerton and Queen Charlotte is, was Queen Charlotte black? It's important to note that Shonda Rhimes never claimed that Queen Charlotte is a true history. In fact, it's actually quite the opposite. But that hasn't stopped speculation. There are some theories, however, that Queen Charlotte could be of African descent. Historians are actually divided on whether or not Queen Charlotte has African descent in her bloodline or not. The theory was popularized by Mario de Valdes e Cocum, who believed that Charlotte was descended from a black branch of the Portuguese royal family, coming from Alfonso III and his concubine, Oruana. Valdes tells the Washington Post that Alfonso III of Portugal conquered a little town named Faro from the Moors, and he demanded the governor's daughter as a paramour, and he had three children with her. According to Valdes, one of these children was married into Queen Charlotte's family, and he points to portraits suggesting that Charlotte was indeed black, although frequently he believed the artist whitewashed her appearance, as Queen Charlotte itself depicts through Princess Augusta. Whatever the truth may actually be, in this matter, Queen Charlotte is far from the first mixed race queen in British history. As a matter of fact, there is another theory that suggests that Philippa of Hainault, the consort of Edward III, had African ancestry as well. Bridgerton certainly suggests British history books have been whitewashed a whole lot more than what people think. Queen Charlotte also introduces the idea of the Great Experiment, which is a politically motivated move to try to unite people of Great Britain together regardless of races, all for strengthening the country. Along with Charlotte's betrothal to George, which actually has nothing to do with race and everything with uniting Charlotte's country with Great Britain, Princess Augusta, George's mother, orchestrates peerages for each of the powerful black and other minority race families in the ton, including the Duke of Hastings, Simon Bassett's parents, and the Smythe Smiths. This is essentially the first steps to ending racism and racial inequality in the Bridgerton universe, and it's something that the original show established as fact without explaining. The Great Experiment was a wonderful addition to the show and to the the Bridgerton universe. However, there is no evidence that proves that this really happened during the Regency era in Great Britain. Although Queen Charlotte, a Bridgerton story is fiction, a lot of the main ideas in the show are historically accurate. Charlotte and George were married to try to create an alliance between Charlotte's home country and Great Britain. Their marriage was turbulent, but it was raw and it was real. They had a true marriage full of love and happiness as well as problems. George did struggle with mental illness, and according to research and genealogy, Charlotte likely has African descent in her. The show itself is fiction. It's dramatic. It's spicy. It's romantic. But it's pretty historically accurate too. If you learned something new or you enjoyed this video, leave a comment, like this video, subscribe to my page, and hit that noni bell for more spilled tea in history.